to Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. We'll begin at verse 1. Um, and as you're finding your place, I meant to uh, share with you some good news before the, the time of prayer together. Um, many of you have prayed for my daughter, Gloriana, as she had her second cochlear implant surgery a few weeks ago. And uh, Thursday, we were able to, um, we, it's called Activation Day. And so they, they celebrate at the University of Chicago. They give you uh, a hearing birthday certificate. And so, um, yeah, she received her device and everything went smoothly and um, she's hearing well out of it. And so that's a huge answer to prayer. And um, my wife and I and some of you have, have talked and uh, it's just such a, a comfort to see. Um, we don't recognize it as such often enough, but it's a comfort to see that her ability to hear is, is really no different than what we see Jesus doing in the New Testament as far as miraculously opening the deaf ears. And so um, I just want to rejoice with you and give thanks with you that um, God's so faithful in that and that we can recognize that and it's not a matter of, well, was this science or was this God? Um, we could say yes. Yes, it was. And, uh, and thank God for that. Um, before we hear God's word together, why don't we uh, pray together and ask God's blessing. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us this morning. God, we thank you that you have uh, received our praise to you this morning. God, we thank you that you have received our offerings for you this morning. God, we pray that this morning you would receive our open ears and hearts this morning. God, we pray that you would help us to be wise as we hear your word and not just um, hear it and walk away like a person who, who looks in the mirror and forgets what he looks like, but instead that we would hear your word, that we would be transformed by it, and that by your Holy Spirit we would live better for you not only today but also in the days to come. God, we thank you for speaking to us. God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord my God, my rock and my redeemer. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Micah 5, beginning at verse 1, uh, the words also will be on the screen. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. When the Assyrian come into our land and treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men. They shall shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod at its entrances, and he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and treads within our border." I'm going to begin our study today by making what might be the least controversial political statement you've heard for a while, and that's this. Everyone wants good political leaders. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. All right, good, okay. Um, least divisive statement you've heard politically in a long, long time. Everyone wants good political leaders. Uh, even in our contentious political landscape, we can all agree, both sides of the aisle, that we want good political leaders. And the problem is we might have different ideas of what makes a good political leader. But rather than get into questions of big government versus small government, or how to solve the health care problems, or how to solve the schools problems, or how to solve the poverty problems, boy, there's a lot of problems that need solving. This is all the more reason to pray for our political leaders. Um, rather than focus on that, instead, Let's focus on what any hypothetically good political leader would do. They would uh, make sure that the needs of the people are met. 
right? That's what good leaders do. They would ensure the security of their people. That's a good thing to do. They would provide a clear way for the people to live well. Ultimately, they would provide opportunity for people to thrive in their lives. And in the United States, our president is to be something beyond those things. Our president is also uh, the chief citizen. Um, and, and according to Wikipedia, they represent all the people of the country and are to provide moral leadership for the country. So it's not just taking care of our country, but also trying to be a good moral leader for our country. And of course, we have politicians at all levels of government, not just the president of our country. The ancient world had a single ruler system. They had a monarchy, a king who ruled the people. And for the people of Israel, the king didn't just focus on security for the people and well-being for the people and meeting the needs of the people. No, the king was also kind of like our chief citizen in that he was to show the people how to walk with God. That he was to be a prime moral example. That he was to lead them in righteousness. And that's what the king of Israel was supposed to do. People during the time of, of Micah's writing were mostly led by a king named Ahaz. And 2 Kings 16 tells us that Ahaz was not a good king. 2 Kings 16 tells us that, that Ahaz did not walk in the ways of David, his father. We're told that Ahaz went to other countries and he found out what gods they were worshiping. He found out what kind of religious practices they had, and, and he made sacrifices on foreign gods' altars. And in fact, he, he was so uh, caught up in, in this foreign god worship that, that he asked some of his priests to copy the plans, to copy the layout, to copy the liturgy of what was going on there so it would be more convenient for him in Israel to be able to, to worship in that same way to worship false gods right in his backyard. And it didn't even stop there. We're also told that King Ahaz was so evil that he even sacrificed his own son to these foreign gods. And he did what was required of these foreign religions. And he killed his own child for these foreign gods. It's horrible. And so these words we read must have been refreshing for the people because they have this King Ahaz who is such a horrible moral leader for them. And in our text in verse 2, we're told of a king from ancient days. We're told of a king from ancient days. In verse 2, we're told, From Bethlehem, shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. God is promising that there would be a king who would come from old, a king from ancient days. You know, in literature, there are stories about ancient kings, about kings who lived hundreds of years ago, and this promise that maybe one day these kings will return and will save us because those days of a hundred years ago were, were so wonderful in our country and, and maybe one day this king will come back. And, um, you, know, we can, you know, there's a lot of people in this country that do that with President Reagan. You know what I mean? It's almost this thing of like, oh, wouldn't that be great if we could have him back, right? And, um, and, and it's true in, in literature, too, that um, there's stories, and you think about C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, and, and the first couple of books of the Chronicles of Narnia are about these, these four kids who, who wander into this wardrobe and end up in another world. They end up in the world of Narnia. And while they're there, they meet all these talking animals, and they, they meet this, this great king, Aslan, who it turns out represents God, and there's all these beautiful spiritual truths there. And, and eventually, these four kids become kings and queens of Narnia. And in the second book, they, they go back, and they, they serve again. And then in the later books, the people of Narnia have this deep longing to say, I wish that the high king Peter would come back 
and save our people. I wish that the great King Edmund would come back and save our people. I wish that the beautiful Queen Susan or Queen Lucy would come back and save our people. And there's this deep longing to say, oh, for those years of long ago when those great kings and queens ruled the land, I wish that they would come back and save us. And what you might not know is that that C.S. Lewis wasn't really original in picking up on these ideas. C.S. Lewis was actually a professor of literature, and he, he knew all kinds of, of literature that had happened in, in the years past. And, and so what he's picking up on is this, this strain of great stories that, that look back to these kings of, of old. And so some of these stories are part truth, and even some of them are part myth. And, and so there's these stories of, of people like King Arthur and the sword and the stone and, and the, the great conquests and the things that he did. And, and some of these things are, are so wonderful that they couldn't even be true. And yet, yet there are these stories that, that make people for hundreds of years later say, I wonder if that ancient king, I wonder if that king from of old will come back one day. Wouldn't it be marvelous? Wouldn't it be wonderful if that old king would show up on the scene again and save his people. And I would say that all those stories, lowercase s, seem to be pointing to this story, capital S. Right? All those stories are, are picking up on this strain of this ancient king of old. And it seems like God himself wrote that first story where this king, who's the ancient of days, this king from of old, would come and rescue his people. Micah says this ancient king will come one day. And the gospel says this ancient future king is Jesus himself. This ancient future king is Jesus himself. He is the king who would be born in lowly Bethlehem. That's what Micah 5 verse 2 is talking about. This, this little town that barely gets a spot on the map, little Bethlehem would be the place where the greatest king, the ancient king of old, would be born. He is the one who is the ancient of days. And though he was born as a newborn baby, he is at the same time the one who created all things in heaven and on earth. The Gospels begin with Jesus' birth in Matthew and Luke. And the Gospel of John begins long before that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? And there's this marvelous truth that, that Jesus, though he is this newborn baby, he's also the second person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's not created, but he's co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He is the ancient future king, the one of old that every story has been about. I mentioned Narnia earlier, and uh, C.S. Lewis is the author of the Chronicles of Narnia. One of his good friends was J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote the Lord of the Rings books. Um, and often, Tolkien and Lewis would get together, and they would spend time together and talk. And, and for some of you who are, are literature nerds like me, um, you wish that you could just be a fly on the wall to say, what would those conversations be like to hear the author of the Chronicles of Narnia talk with the author of the Lord of the Rings? You know, like, wouldn't that be great to just eavesdrop on that conversation, right? But, but before Lewis was a Christian, Tolkien was a strong believer. Lewis was a self-proclaimed atheist. He, he believed in, uh, in the, 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 sort of the overarching uh, power of science. Uh, he thought that science was really the thing that, that could answer all of life's greatest problems and thought that there was no need for God. And, and as Tolkien and Lewis conversed and de developed their relationship and their friendship and they bounce ideas off each other, and uh, one night, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien were walking on the grounds of Magdalene College where C.S. Lewis was a literature professor. And it was about 2, 3 in the morning. They'd been talking and smoking pipes and hanging out with other literature friends. And, and then they're, they're walking down this path together. And 
Tolkien is describing to Lewis what we're describing here in our text, that, that all these stories you've heard seem to point to some other story. It, it seems like all these stories about an ancient king, it seems like all these stories about someone from of old coming to rescue his people, it seems like, like they have a common source. And Tolkien went on to tell Lewis that, that Scripture is that source. It's that God has been writing that story. And, and, and almost in the same way that, uh, that animals have it in their DNA, that instinctively they know how to do certain things, it's like God has written it in our DNA to hear this story, to be stirred by this story, to say there's a great king who's coming to save his people. And as Tolkien described that to Lewis, Lewis said that, he believed that by the power of the Holy Spirit, it, it stirred in his heart to say, I get it. This is true. And, and what, what Lewis said in his own words were, it's like the story of the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ, the story of this great king coming to save his people is a story like all the other stories, but it's come true. That's how it is for us as Christians when we understand that, that this story is a deeper story. Micah says that this king will, our next point, Christ stands and shepherds his flock. Christ stands and shepherds his flock. Most believe that Micah, who's the author of this book, was a shepherd himself. So Micah would know the way that a shepherd took care of his sheep. Micah would know that a shepherd knows each of his sheep by name and he cares for them. Micah would know that nothing was too small to do for his sheep. If it was pulling a thorn from their foot, if it was making sure that, that they're well fed, if it's making sure that every need is met, Micah would know how much a shepherd cares. And he says that Jesus would be the one who would stand and shepherd his flock. Jesus confirms this when he says that he is the good shepherd and that his, his flock know his voice. That same care that we hear about sheep is the same care that Jesus provides for us. It's the same care that many of us know those well-loved words of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And it's this picture of God providing every need for us. And in the gospel, when Jesus reveals himself as the good shepherd, when he reveals himself as the shepherd king who would come to take care of his people, we recognize that he is the one who leads us into green pastures, that he is the one who leads us beside still waters, that he is the one who leads us in paths of righteousness, right? That he is the one who provides for every need that we could have. The rest of the gospel tells us that Jesus did more than just meet those daily needs for us, greater than any shepherd for his sheep. Jesus puts himself in harm's way. The picture I get is, you can imagine a sheep just standing here and, and this oncoming danger coming at the sheep. And, and it's as if the shepherd just leans forward and, and le takes his whole body in front of the sheep and says, me before them. I'm going to make sure that any harm that would befall them will hit me first. And it's not just Jesus getting in harm's way, but Jesus gets in death's way for us. Jesus knew full well why he came to earth. Jesus knew full well that it was the will of the Father for him to, to lay down his life for us. And you might say, as some critics and some cynics say today, well, you know what Jesus, the story of Jesus is, it's just a story like you just said was so, so horrible of, of someone sacrificing his child. Child sacrifice is exactly what happened with Jesus. And how can you say that child sacrifice is bad in the case of Ahaz and it's good in the case of God? Let me tell you. It's not that God just said to his son, you go. But God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. God gave of himself. No other example of sacrifice, of pushing your kids into the fire to appease the gods, 
is anything like what God did for us. God put on the flesh and gave of himself for us. Not just putting himself in harm's way, but going all the way to death for us. And what happens as a result? Our next point. He gives us peace through deliverance. That's what verses 5 and 6 tell us. Verse 5 says that he himself is our peace. Do you know that peace and joy are somewhat related? You know how joy works. It's that deep down in your soul sense of happiness that flows from what Jesus has done for you. It's a sense that even if the whole world should fall, even if I lose everything in this life that I love, I still have Jesus, and that still brings my soul a deep sense of happiness. Probably the greatest example of this in Scripture is the story of Job. Job lost everything. Lost every worldly possession. Lost his own children. He lost his health. And still he had joy. He could still recognize that the Lord gives and takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What he sensed in an early understanding as a person of God is what our sense is as people of God who've been purchased by Jesus' blood, that my sense of emotional stability and happiness isn't based on my external circumstances. It's based on what God has done for me in Christ Jesus. And that's how peace is, too. It's not just that I have this inner sense of calm and having things together when everything in life is going as it should, when our country is stable, when my job is stable, when my relationships are stable, when my finances are stable, then my soul is stable. No, it means that if everything else is falling apart, my job, my finances, my relationships, my country, everything else is falling apart, I still have this deep-seated sense of stability and security in my soul. Amen? Amen. Because of what Christ has done for me, I can't be shaken. No one can take that peace away, even if it's chaos in the world around me. Jesus Christ is my peace. And he's given us peace by deliverance. Deliverance from enemies. Micah speaks about surrounding countries. He talks about places around them that were threatening to undo the people of God. And there's these real national security threats around them. These places that could do great harm to them. And I'm sure the people of God, Israel, were scared. They thought, what's going to happen with the Assyrians? What's going to happen with all these strong armies around us? What are they going to do to us? And Micah speaks about this ancient king of old who would shepherd his people, who would give us peace, and who would deliver us from these enemies around us. Dear people of God, Christ does even more than deliver us from neighboring countries. Instead, he saves us from the enemies that have been most opposed to us ever since the time that our ancestors first disobeyed God. Surrounding countries, strong enemies and dictators might last for a decade or for a generation maybe two centuries at the most, where you say there's still problems with this country, there's still problems with that country. Jesus deals with a much deeper enemy. In Christ, we're delivered from sin. In Christ, we're delivered from all the opposition that's been, that we've invited into the world since we first disobeyed God. In Christ, we're delivered from the world and the way that the world influences us and tells us to disobey God, tells us to be our own rulers. In Christ, we're delivered from Satan. In Christ, we're delivered even from ourselves. Sometimes we think about salvation. We only want to talk about being saved from sin and being saved from the world and being saved from Satan. But sometimes we need salvation most from ourselves, right? Because we're the biggest problem and we're the ones that drag us down the most. And Christ offers that for us exactly. And if he's done that for you, how do you respond in faith? Our next point. In trust, we live under his word and rule. 
What this means is that even though the world tells us otherwise, we don't listen to our heart. We don't listen to ourselves. We don't seek simply to be true to me. But instead, we recognize that those are fickle places that aren't the best sources of truth. Scripture says that, that we can't even trust our own hearts because they're so sinful. And so we're called, instead of listening to our hearts, we're called to listen to Scripture. Instead of listening to ourselves, we're called to listen to the body of Christ. Instead of trying to, to be true to ourselves, we're called to be true to God, knowing that he has given us new life, knowing that we owe our lives to him. You know, as parents, we have, we have five kids at home. As parents, we try to be, um, we try to be reasonable with our kids, right? And we try to, to give them a reason for why we're doing what they're doing. We're, we're trying to um, help them know that, you know, the reason we wash our dishes is um, because we don't want our kitchen sink to become a biology experiment, right? We, we do these things for a reason. The reason that, we, that we, we bathe and shower and brush our teeth is because we want to practice good hygiene and take good care of our bodies. The reason we pick up our toys is we want to make sure that if someone just pops in, the, pay, the place isn't a total mess and that we want to know, you know, if, if we're looking for a toy, we know where to find it because we put it where it belongs, right? There's, there's reason for all these things. But there are times when we simply say, and maybe you as parents are better than us, but we simply say, because I said so, right? That's why. The reason you have to do this is because I'm the dad and you're not, right? And, and you just have to do it. And sometimes those answers happen out of urgency. You know, like, don't touch the grill. And we don't have time to sit down and explain, you know, the, the, the laws of thermodynamics and how heat transfers from a stainless steel grill to your fingers and can give you second or maybe even third degree burn. So let's talk this out and diagram this. No, just stop. Don't touch. Right? And it's just that simple. Sometimes it's urgency, but sometimes it's lack of patience, where, you know, I just told you five minutes ago why, and so just do it, right? Um, and that's sometimes how God's word is, too. That sometimes we hear reasons to be pure. Sometimes we hear reasons for honoring our parents that we may live long in the land that the Lord our God is giving us. But sometimes it's not so clear. And sometimes... We're simply told, set apart the Sabbath day as a day of rest. Make sure that you rest and worship on God's day. And yes, we could find reasons and we could know that there's a reasonableness to it. But sometimes it's just a matter of saying, because God said so. Because he is king and I am not. The idea of following him, of obeying him, of saying, this king has laid down his life for me and I want to live under his rule and his reign and live according to his word. That idea isn't just something that we do in part of our life. It's not just something that we do at 9.30 on Sunday morning. Or it's not just something that we do one day of the week. God can't be our part-time king. And so the question becomes, every day, every moment, who is Christ to me? C.S. Lewis said something along these lines, that you either have to say about Christ as king, this is ridiculous, he is not the king, I can live however I want because he doesn't mean anything to me, or you say, he is this ancient king of old. He is this one that Micah prophesied about thousands of years ago. He is exactly who he said he is as far as shepherding me, caring for me, but also he's the one who's given his life for me. And I have to treat him as such. I can't treat him as a great new accessory. I can't treat him as an add-on in my life. I can't treat him as my personal assistant who helps me out when I need him. But instead, if I understand rightly that Scripture is saying that he's my king, I have to live every day of my life under his rule. I have to live every moment of my life under his rule. I have to say, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, I'm going to love the Lord my God and my king. 
I have to say, I'm going to love my neighbor as myself because my king has commanded me so. This is what it looks like to live under his rule. This is what it looks like to recognize what he's done for us. And so I close this morning with this question. And I want it to be not just a question where you fill out the blank and you forget about it, but instead a question that you keep asking yourself, a question that you keep saying throughout this day, throughout this week. How are you showing Christ is king today? How are you showing that he's the one who's given his life for yours? How are you showing that you don't want him as a part-time king, but you want him to rule and reign in your life? How are you showing that you're obeying him, not just when you can find the reasons, but also when you say, because he's king and I'm not? May all of us live faithfully to him by the power of the Holy Spirit today. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for speaking to us in your word today. God, thank you that you did not spare your son, Jesus Christ, but you gave him for us. And God, thank you um, that in doing so, you didn't just send someone else to do the hard work, but you sent yourself, God in the flesh. And our minds can't wrap around that, but God, we pray that, your heart, that our hearts would, that you would help us understand by the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, and as a result of it, you would empower us by your spirit to say we want to live for you. We want to show.